off of you Yeah, yo There whenever it matters and even more when you feel like it doesn't Protect you so you never feel like you wasn't Know I'm right alongside you, here by that I'm behind you But always got you, end the discussion, nothing means more First one to offer his shoulders for what you preach for Thought I saw the eyes of the world until I seen yours And know that I ain't see a better view yet I'm with whatever, so don't ever you fret Know that you covered, not a hurdle or a heartbreak To change what a part take Cause none of them won't ever get comfortable in your walkway My job is to aware you, fully loaded to prepare you for all of the above that I'm never letting get near you but still in all give you every advantage I found couldn't find a better fit for them along with my crown and since the baton was passed I've been down cause feeling's not an option and dad is not a noun not at all Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Ishmael from Dad Is Not A Now. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? I have two great guests with me. They both have things in common, and that's why I have them both on. One, they served our country well. One brother served in the Navy. One brother served in the military. And then also- Army, 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 Army. Army. Military. I get it. I get it confused. But it's still the military. <laughs> military. military is the umbrella. Uh, the umbrella. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's the White it's House. It's okay. It's okay. It's a very sensitive issue among the intermilitary <laughs> organizations. <laughs> it's all right. All love to everybody, though. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's love movement. He said yeah. it better than me. <laughs> but go Navy beat Army. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the most important thing is that while serving, they're giving back, especially when it comes to mental health. You know, one of the stories we don't talk about is when soldiers come back, where do they go for help? And what these brothers do is they create this platform to help them. And I'm truly honored to have these brothers on. Introduce yourself. Boyd, go first. You go first, Boyd. My name is Boyd Melson. I'm, I'm still serving in the reserve. I'm a major in the 361 T pace. I'm, <laughs> I'm a public health service officer. I, I had one deployment to Iraq and I did try to do my very best to help uh, with different causes. And right now my life's oriented me uh, much more significantly towards mental health. I, I've been on the advisory board for Stop Soldier Suicide for some time, but now I'm trying to take a much more proactive role with this. So uh, that's what's important leading into here, I suppose. Definitely. Caesar, go for it, brother. So honored to be here with you, Ishmael. Thank you for having me. Boyd, Melson, and I, for the last half an hour, have been connecting. <laughs> I feel like I've known this brother for the last 30 years, and I yes, appreciate you being here. Uh, my name is Cesar F. Barajas. I am an international wellness mentor, mental health advocate. I served in the U.S. Navy from 1993 to 2000 and grew up with a variety of We'll call them struggles, we'll call them hindrances, we'll call them obstacles, we'll call them traumas, but whatever they were by name, they shaped me into a man that I stopped enjoying being. And if it wasn't for organizations like the Veterans Yoga Project, if it wasn't for my own bravery in reaching out to seek therapy and counseling, I honestly wouldn't be alive today. And I, it led me to found my own organization called The Journey with Caesar. You'll see it down on the bottom written out. But if you visit the journey with Caesar.com, it is now an affordable subscription based meditation library. I also serve as a coach and a consultant for those that suffer from any kind of mental health struggles as an advisor, uh, ear to listen. Uh, I'm also an adjunct professor at Columbia University where I teach meditation and mindfulness for their summer principals academy in the teacher's college. All in all to say that I'm just trying to still be a good human but I love being a teacher and a guide and am very excited to be here. Thank you very much. No, thank, thank you for coming. You. Thank you guys. Um, when I, the reason why I have you guys on is because I'm in, in at all of your journey, right? Cause sometimes it's not about the destination. It's about mm. the journey, right? And then also I like using this phrase is like, when you're in your journey, you master that journey. And I think both of you guys have mastered your journey. So it, tell me about a little bit about your journey and how you able to master that journey. I'll jump in and start uh, just very briefly. Like I said, um, growing up, and I'm open about this because it, I think, affords someone an opportunity to 
to listen and say, hey, you know what, there's someone else that is either going through something very similarly structured or, yo, I'm not alone. But I'm first generation Latin, a son to two very proud Mexican immigrants, grew up in Texas and currently New York City based, but found that the world that I was living in as awesome as it is, on top of everything that I described, I'm also a professional performer. I've been dancing professionally, ballet companies, modern companies. I've worked with JLo, Chris Brown, Broadway Regional Musical Theater. So I've gotten to live this really cool life, but I tell people all the time, like I was doing all of these really neat things and traveling the world and serving my country and I was miserable. I struggled. Child abuse as a kid, I lost my virginity as a rape victim to a female camp counselor when I was 15. So that shaped who I became as a young man. It turned me into a rageaholic. So in order for me to, to deal with things, I would get angry and I thought I was protecting myself, but all I was doing ultimately was hurting people. And it all accumulated about 11 years ago when my then wife left. Right. And that's when I knew I needed to seek licensed therapeutic help. So I tell people I've been on this path of emotional sobriety for 11 years. And one of the things I want to focus on is how the last 18 to 20 months in our current state of the world has affected so many different people. And I love that meditation and mindfulness is now on the tips of everyone's tongues and it's on the forefront of people's conversations. But hi, we're talking about things that affect people and have been affecting people since the first generation of man, since Adam and Eve came out of the garden. And so last year I found myself yet again in a very similarly structured just place. And my partner and I, greatest love of my life separated because she had to leave. I had become yet again a danger to myself, to her. And the focus now in having this conversation is to tell anybody listening, yo, I don't care if you're black, white, brown, polka dot identifying, it doesn't matter your sexual orientation, creed, religion, whatever it is that you identify as, yo, everybody. And Boyd and I were talking about this prior to this, everybody suffers from something and it's okay. Wow. Boy, you want to go, brother? Thank you. For for sharing that and, and being so tough to put yourself on the line. Thank you. That's the start for, for everything. It's, that's the spark, that's the raindrop to get people to feel okay about living in that weather. Thank you. Um, you know, my, first, I, I didn't realize until I got older how much it affected me growing up being uh, looking like I do while being mm -hmm. African American and then being Jewish at the same time from mm -hmm. my mother's side and how I didn't understand how I I this trauma of never feeling like I, like I fit in anywhere affected me so much and being born into having a daddy who's Louisiana Creole so I'm a product of slavery, descendants of slaves, raping, being raped by slave owners on that side. And then the other side of attempted genocide and the Holocaust. And still never feel, feeling like I fit in. And I guess that opened up, like I have this I guess, genetic compassion in my DNA. And I, it's a mix of, you know, I went to West Point and I, I learned about the sport of boxing there and I stuck with it. And then the end of my junior year, I met a young lady who was paralyzed in a wheelchair and I fell in love with her. And we were together for six years and I promised I'd never give up on helping her walk again. And uh, you know, I had the honor of boxing for the army and boxing for Team USA and being an alternate for the Olympics. And then I decided to use that skill set to turn pro so I could donate everything I earned in the ring to spinal cord research because I promised her I, I'll never give up on helping her walk again. And along that journey, I started being exposed to so many different types of life struggles. You know, minority youth without daddies in their lives and, and the drug addicted community trying to be sober and the, the veteran suicide community and spinal cord injured community. God, do I know a lot about that and being involved with that. And then uh, just different, phys different autoimmune challenged communities and and constantly finding that I seem to feel most comfortable 
around them. And I think it's because I've learned about myself, the trauma that I've underwent when I was growing up, never feeling like I was being seen, that whenever I'm around those demographics, they're raw. Uh, they see, they judge you off your kindness. And it made me feel safe that I could totally be me. And that was it. And I knew that when I looked at them, whatever emotion they were showing was the truth. And that's usually what happens when you get stripped of everything. All you have left is your emotion. And I didn't realize until I deployed in 2018 how affected I had been, how much rage I lived with while pushing and pushing to try to get these goals. I I would choose to become combative towards things that stood in my way. And then still while being in a sport like boxing, I was always prepped to be combative. So it spilled over into my life outside of that and feeling that if you didn't see the vision the way I did, it, you got to get out of my way and I'm gonna, you're going to see a different side of me to get you out of the way if you don't want to move because I got to get these goals done. And it, while being deployed for those nine months, I started realizing how many dirty dishes I created in my life that I had never washed. And and while chasing, going after these goals and dreams, and I come to learn, you know, tra chasing dreams, you create casualties. And usually it's people you love the most that you end up hurting. And you don't mean to be doing it, but you're creating these casualties and they're dirty dishes. And if you don't go back and clean them, you know, it's like planting landmines. Yeah. And eventually, even though they love you, they're going to go off. And you'll find yourself divorced or you'll find yourself having your mother that doesn't want to speak to you anymore and that's your mother okay. or you'll find yourself angry at people because they never washed you from certain things and you haven't found peace with it yet and that's what I've kind of been on this journey with since then and I've come to realize that I see a part of me in every group that I'm helping that's struggling yeah. so, uh, and it'd be interesting because people would never guess how often I cry and how I have all these challenges, even though I'm smiling because I'm a happy person. Mm. But I'm also mm. a lonely. I'm a lonely person. Right. At the same time, uh, very lonely, and lonely even when I'm surrounded by a lot of people because I don't sometimes think that they're. I watch what they value, and I sometimes I feel it's not what's important so much. Because it's it's so much on the on the top layer for what they allow to affect them negatively. Yeah. When I've been around so much suffering, right. and I'm suffering, <laughs> that I know what more needs to happen. And to close this part on out, I've come to learn. You know, I, you know, when, when they, I've read up a lot about and people who are empathic, and I don't meet the criteria for being an empath. But that doesn't mean I'm not empathic. Mm -hmm. I don't hit them all. I, I realize this drive I have to keep going is because I feel words and I, I experience them. I experience things happening that I learn about that I've no, I've never met or participated in. I just, and it sticks in me. I can't let it go, and that hurts my wellness because it makes me tell somebody I have dinner plans with, I can't do that for you. I got to go help this stranger. I'm at, but that's because it's hurting me. It's right. my own survival mechanism. I want the pain to stop for me. It's not even so much maybe just to help that person. It's because it's, it's affecting me. I don't know how to separate myself from that, but the best thing I can do is just hopefully find a partner in life that's in alignment with that. And that's a big part. And that makes it hard for me to find somebody or and hard to still be understood as an adult but I say it out loud more and, and I don't mind saying it out loud because it gives life to it and allows me to hear it. If you, when I say things in my own brain, I, I, I manipulate the word so it makes sense. Right. And that, that further perpetuates a cycle. <laughs> I mm. got to hear what I'm thinking. You no one's listening. I'm listening. <laughs> no, you, you, bro. You, 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 you it's, 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 you're absolutely right. And I thank you guys for sharing that with me because that's important because people need to know everybody's journey. We have our own journeys and it's important that we hear everybody's journeys because you know what, what you told me, boy, Caesar, what you told me, I can apply that to my life. 
And I think mm. that's important to share those journeys. And I see trauma as like gunshots. And it's the one phrase I like hearing. I think you know about it. Um, sometimes gunshot, gunshots shine brighter than the sun. And those gunshots are self-inflicted because of our, our, what people done to us or mm. we've done for ourselves. So how were you able to like heal yourself from those traumas? I know you're still struggling with it. You're going, you're, you're, you're getting through it, but how, how, what have you done to help you um, to deal with that? I, actually, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to take a deep breath before I answer that. And I'm, I'm going to invite our listeners and, and Boyd and Ishmael, if you're comfortable, just taking a deep breath with me. <sighs> because I'm still sitting with the gems that my man Boyd dropped. And in speaking to him, getting to a place of comfort, and thank you, Boyd, for sharing your aspects, but getting to a place where you can talk about it reminds me of one of my favorite teaching ex phrases, and expression is the opposite of depression. Right. Suppression leads to depression. So the idea of being able to even speak to it, because first off, within the realm of our listeners, we can't see you, we can't hear you, we don't know what you identify as, but within this room right here, we've got three strong men of color. Three strong men of color, and even if you listening don't identify as a man of color or a woman of color, you're still derived from a lineage. Like historically, you come from kings and queens and magicians and lovers and warriors. So I'm, I'm, I'm receiving, Boyd, your sharing of being of African-American descent, Louisiana Creole, a mother of Jewish descent. We carry not just the strength of the cultures before us, but we also carry that pain and that oppression and the discriminations. And so that generational trauma shows up in us from birth and we not even we haven't even done anything yet and it's already a part of our genetic predisposition so to answer your question ishmael how do i how have i healed from it god's honest truth i haven't good i just now over the last year realized being a son of mexican parents means that i'm derived from civilizations that were astronomers and farmers and warriors and family members and lovers. And so part of my healing over the last year has been part of embracing my cultural strengths. Because what we're doing right now, what Ishmael, you as a host and what you're doing with Dad is Not a Noun, the Boyd's doing what I'm doing, we're rewriting genetically predisposed neuropathological Discrepancies, we're rewiring, we're reshifting, we're rethinking, we're breaking generational bonds of trauma. And so then everyone who's going to meet us after the fact is going to be affected, hopefully positively, but it's always going to be a work in progress. I'm not healed. I'll tell you what, though, there are days where I wake up and I've had a good hour. Right. And then the next hour, something comes up or I'm like, nope. I'm not feeling great anymore. And I'm at a point now where I physically recognize what's going on with me. I emotionally recognize. And then I ask myself some basic questions. Am I safe? What do I need? And sometimes what I need is a giant chocolate chip cookie. And sometimes what I need is to go and hit the heavy bag for 30 minutes. I mean, it, it's going to vary. So I, I'm not fully healed, but I know that I am in the process of healing. And mm -hmm. it's a lifelong process for me. Boy, very interested to hear your your response to that. And so I would have bet a million, any amount that you were going to say you're not healed yet, just to let you know that um, mm. it's never ending process. And for anyone to stand up there like they got the answers, they're lying. They have answers, but it's not the answers. Otherwise, they wouldn't be a human. Mm. It doesn't end. You're constantly having to regulate, and there's always that moment to come in to give you an experience you've never been through before. Brand new for you to learn about yourself again. And what I try to do is 
I think about what story do I want to tell mm. when I talk about what I what happened when this I think about that often I try to put myself how am I going to tell the story of how I reacted and I fall short sometimes I react before thinking about the story right. but my emotions get the best of me and and I'm getting better at catching it almost in real time to stop mm -hmm. it wow. before it does because I'm so aware of I want to be this story. This is how I want to remember that I behaved when this happened because I'm going to tell this one day to somebody yeah. and this is who I want to be. And I talk out loud to myself all the time so I can hear what I'm thinking and if I'm in a mode where I, I'm feeling like I want to hurt somebody, I'll say out loud the most vicious thing so I could hear it. And I start realizing it takes work to stay in that space. Mm -hmm. And then I start realizing, what am I saying? I'm not going to do any of those things. That's not, but I said it instead of letting it fester because you can just keep that poison inside. I say it. I'll go somewhere quiet and I'll just say some horrible things <laughs> if I need to when I'm in a safe space so I can hear it and I know that that's not me. Uh, did I press a button? Yeah, I know that that's not me. Uh, I keep doing this and I keep offering my faults. I keep offering it and saying it where, or I'll say where I'm falling short to be honest with myself. So it gives me something to strive towards, an ideal, a vision. Kind of like they say with our flag that we that we that we defend, we don't we don't defend the person who's in charge of the country at that time. We defend the vision that that flag stands for. The vision, it's always something to aspire towards. It never ends because we're never gonna get it right. We're humans. But we can try. And by saying it out loud, thinking about the story and constantly reflecting, going over my dishes. And now that I'm turning 40 this year, I have enough life experience. I've gone through so many things to see what the consequences were. Kind of know this last time you reacted this way, you know what happened. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's not worth it again. And you're going to hurt more people if you do this. And really, is it going to get you to where you want to be? And the light may give you some momentary relief, like a catharsis, right. but that's not what you were hoping for. You didn't do it just because you wanted to have a catharsis. You, whatever you're trying to do, is because you have a desired end state. So saying it out loud, but no, and I, I'm, I, I have many daggers inside. I've hurt so many people that I can't change, and I didn't go out of my way to hurt them. Oh. Yeah. But I can't change it. And all I can do is be who I am now and do my best to write the story differently whenever I get the next opportunity and find peace. And, and it's hard forgiving myself for things, but I'm getting better at it by recognizing who I am now. And I've learned you get so comfortable in feeling guilty about certain mm -hmm. things that you don't yeah. want to forgive yourself. You get comfort in being in that space when you're there for long enough. And so we convince ourselves that if we forgive ourselves, then maybe it wasn't such a bad thing we did. You can forgive yourself and still recognize it was such yeah. a bad thing you did. Like if I hurt Kristen doing something and I forgive myself, that means that I, I trick myself by meaning that must mean that I, I don't think it was that bad how I hurt her. Right. No, it does. But now it's upon me to decide what story I want to write from here forward. So right. being aware is what helps me and not letting myself go in that cycle of guilt. Mm -hmm. Can I add something to go that? Ahead, Ishmael? And Boyd, yes. Go for it, brother. What, what Boyd is referencing, listeners, is is I, I it resonates with me personally, and I'm sure if we had people raising emoji hands, that they would also agree. Brother Boyd, the guilt and remorse that I still carry for the number of people that I hurt, and it's something that my body recognized. So my body instinctually will go back to that place because it knows it. It's comfortable. For me, for 35 plus years, getting angry was what I knew. 
Getting angry is the only way that I knew to protect myself. Getting angry was the only way to be heard. Getting angry was the only way that I could find myself being in some semblance of control. And it wasn't until I found traditional yoga, meditation, mindfulness, and it reminds us of the idea of impermanence. And nothing is ever going to stay the same. And so I want to tag to the end of what Boyd sh lovingly, brilliantly shared is that his place of awareness is now allowing him to speak what he needs to speak out loud. I love, Boyd, that you say before you go and react to something, you'll go off and maybe say a few things, maybe utter a few obscenities under your breath. <laughs> but what he's doing, I guarantee you folks, is taking several breaths. So here's my man, Boyd, professional level boxer, was taught from the get-go, how to breathe during a boxing match. We talked about, you know, you being 15th round and all of a sudden, why is my man over there able to breathe? <laughs> and I'm, I'm trying to catch my breath. But the idea, friends, is to come back to that place, that foundational strength of breathing. And this is why meditation, mindfulness is important. But I want you to get rid of what meditation and mindfulness is in your head, because it's nothing more than mindful thinking. Mindfulness is nothing more than simply recognizing. You know what? I'm in a crowded subway train in New York. I can feel that my, my, test is, my chest is starting to tighten. Oh, I'm going to do some energy tapping at my heart. Am I safe? Yeah, no one here is trying to hurt me. Extend the exhale. Maybe one more. Maybe five more. Any kind of conscious controlled breath will activate the body's vagus nerve, which then activates the body's parasympathetic nervous system, which activates the rest and digest portion of our body's nervous system. So when you find yourselves, listeners, in a place where you're like, yo, my partner is driving me insane. My kids, they're making too much noise. I've got to get dinner ready and I don't have but 35 minutes. Pause, just pause. Please, 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 I beg of you to pause. Take a deep breath. And as you're listening to us now, I'm gonna ask you to take a deep breath with me. One more time, just breathe in. Maybe the top of the chest rises, maybe the rib cage expands, maybe the belly inflates. And as you breathe out, you're already putting your body in a physiological place of a decompression. What you're doing now as you breathe deeply, consciously, as you think about it, is helping to improve focus and kindness and clarity. And who wouldn't want a few of those breaths under your belt before you walk into that meeting, before we walk into a pitch meeting for a movie, <laughs> before we walk into you know, the ring to, to face our opponent? I, any of those things, taking us taking several deep breaths. And, and boy, your sharing reminded me of that. And I wanted to just lovingly share and graciously invite everyone listening that you can always come back to breathe, but you have to practice it. It's like Boyd was saying, it's a dynamic action. It's lifelong. It's like getting better and better at shooting free throws. If you're not taking, yo, let's go back to Kobe right quick. My man, Kobe, <laughs> one of the greatest ever. God. Yes. <laughs> Gone way too soon. Yeah. Kobe, after practice, would take 500 shots. Yeah. Not 500 hit or miss. He would wait until he hit 500 shots. Yeah. Every practice. That's like practice. Yes. You have to practice to breathe. You have to practice to sit with your emotions. I love, boy, that you shared. You're a happy person, but then there are days where you feel lonely. That resonates so deeply with me. My friends, it is very possible to feel this joy and this happiness, whether it's fleeting or stays with you, and it's also possible at the same time to feel grief-stricken or sad. There are no good or bad emotions, so let's try to get out of that mindset. Let's just figure out ways to constructively or destructively react to them. And I think it all starts with, with breathing and being able to do this, conversate, chat about it. And that, and that's so powerful, Caesar. Thank you for that, boy. You like you're just relaxed. You took like a couple of breaths and we're like you're about to go to sleep now. Isn't it something <laughs> that you noticed that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but you know what? And that's that's what's key is is do we ever notice the tension we carry in our jaw? Do we ever realize just how much we're grinding? So maybe as we sit here and we're listening, maybe you open your jaw a few times and just realize. Oh, if I exhale with an audible sound, I'm helping to relax cheek muscles, mm. the muscles that surround my eyes. I'm helping to relax further the neck, the throat, 
the top of the chest into the shoulders. Maybe I'll realize that I'm drawing my shoulders up too high. So maybe this gives my body an opportunity to relax shoulders towards the floor. All of these things we don't think about because our body will naturally go into a place of tension because it's, the, it's, it's how it protects us. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. It's absolutely normal. Post-traumatic stress, anxieties, depression, any kind of mental health struggles are all absolutely normal reactions, friends. The body is designed to react to stresses and traumas. It's the problem of us staying in a place of hypervigilance or hyperarousal and not coming back down. The body is beautifully designed as it is, is only designed to be in a hypervigilant state for short bursts and only on occasion. And what's going on in our world right now? Systemic racism, broken democracies, yeah. suicide rates increasing. We've got misogynistic, oppressive treatment, mistreatment of women. Never mind our black and brown and indigenous sisters of color yeah. and their treatment throughout history. Let's not get over the fact that as a Latin who's bald headed and tattooed, I can't walk into places without people going, yeah, <laughs> or being on some sort of yeah. guard. Yeah. And I'm, I've got master's degrees. I'm educated. I teach at an Ivy League university, but no one wants to hear any of that. Yeah. We're a society that passes judgment at the drop of a hat. So how can we then put ourselves in a better position to respond to all of that? Pausing. Like Boyd said, talking about it. Seeking I'll, help. Breathing. Yeah, my man, jump in. I'll tell you, Ash, so it wasn't the breathing so much that relaxed me. It's I feel how much Brother Caesar cares. And so that made me, it's going to get me emotional. It made me feel safe. <laughs> and that's what relaxed me. I feel how much he cares. Yeah. Oh, man. So thank you. I'm going to tell that. you right now. Boy, this world is so much better because you're still here. That's right, brother. And the yeah. fact that, Ishmael, you reached out to me yesterday, the emotions are rising because. People don't realize the true power of community, yeah. especially when it comes from a place of non-judgment, unconditional love, a compassionate stance, leading with kindness or inclusivity. Boyd, thank you. Thank you for sharing I that. Thank you, you for openly. I love you, brother. And I can't wait to hug you in person. <laughs> I love it. I, I, don't oh, let, I, don't let, I don't let go. I'm he's, a, he's, he's a great hugger. He's a, I he's a great hugger. I heard, I, heard, I, heard, I heard he's a great hugger. I heard. And you know, and that's where we are right now is like here we are connected virtually world. Not, the three of us have never physically met. No. no. And so there has been some benefit in having to connect online virtually. Thank you, World Wide Web. Yes. But, you know, when you get an opportunity to physically share in that presence, and that's what made the last 20 months with the pandemic, which is still happening, pe yes. people, we're still in the middle of a pandemic, is our social constructs were viciously ripped away. Yeah. And we as humans have to have social connections. Yeah. From birth, the minute we're born... Boyd, I love that you shared that because that's a traumatic experience. You come into the world and there's a room full of people waiting for you to start screaming. But you're only born <laughs> with two fears. Yeah. <laughs> At birth, you're born with the fear of loud noises and you're born with the fear of falling. Yeah. Everything else is learned. Yeah. So Boyd and I were chatting before we started recording. Like if we're born and we're initially met with love yeah. and guidance and compassion, and that's why the first several weeks of life through the age of seven or eight yeah. in the cognitive development of humans is as important as it is. If anything affects that, it affects who you become. But again, it is possible to come back and help to reshift. It just takes work and it's hard. Boy, how much trouble do you have sometimes just getting up and being like, all right, I got to knock this out today. I got a checklist of things. I have the hardest time until I know it has to be done. Yeah. It's very hard. Yeah, it, none of this I, is easy. Yeah, not at all. Despite what it may look like on the exterior, right. I have to have that sense of urgency, which usually happens once I get inspired. But it's yeah. it's not that easy. And I think people may think that those that have so much that they've achieved and achieved and achieved, just wake up and let's get ready to. Lay. Right. No, it's it, it's not usually that way. It's it's tr there. Are certain things have to trigger it. Yeah. to get the best out of it. And it's the things that are in alignment with our values that touch. It's, and it's hard for us to fake it. Mm. Mm. 
Right. And what are we in currently? We're in a world that speaks to faking it till you make it. No, yeah. I don't give a damn about the 15 seconds of your life on TikTok right. or on social media. That is not a true reflection of how we live. Yeah. And society, unfortunately, is pushing people in that incorrect direction. Yeah. The truth of the matter is, is people as successful as Boyd, people as successful as myself, people as successful as Ishmael, all come from places where we have had to work, yeah. work, dirt under our fingernails, work to get to where we are. And then there are days where we get knocked down. Boyd, please speak to the adage of getting knocked down in the ring and getting right back up. Oh, my God. <laughs> giving ourselves a chance to get up. Yeah. You know, I'm going to share some no personal. So I'm in a grad school program at, at Harvard right now. I don't know am I working on a second master's. And I just got dropped from a class because according to the APA style, it's, it was my first time putting a research proposal together and I didn't document correctly. I made the same systematic error every place that I documented. And it, it's obvious because it's so many times over the same error. Wow. The, I got brought up in front of the board of plagiarism. They just dropped me from the class. Wow. And I can't take this one again for at least a year. And I called my mother on the phone and I went to West Point and honor call. Like I wrote such a statement and they still didn't, I guess, didn't believe. Wow. And I talked to my mother on the phone and I said, I said, mommy, I've been alive for so long right now. Try to help and try it holding on for 18 years to try to get someone to walk and tell me how devastating finding out you have to retake a class or someone didn't believe. I said, that's their problem. I'm going to take, when I get another chance again, I'm going to shove it down their throats when I get to take it. Yeah. But that's fine. There's so many other things that are so much worse than this. I know I didn't plagiarize and I made the same mistake. I'm aware. I know when I've tried to get over in life on things, I know I didn't try on this one. So I said, don't worry, I'll be fine. Uh, and I said, they have a policy. And if I went against what they said, I understand. Got to make that own bed, right? Excuses yeah. are the tools of the incompetent. Yeah. I get it. I get it. <laughs> I knew I'd make you yeah. smile. Yeah, I so, know exactly where you got that from. Yeah. So uh, I told her that now I got to retake and you got to think for someone who prides themselves on their integrity to be called out at it by an institution that big, right. they have no idea who I am. I'm just a name taking in a class. And that's, that's still not my issue to deal with. As long as I get to keep take get to take the class and get another chance that's what matters and if that answer was no then i'll just have to adjust and try to find something else to go after with that but i have my health and i remember when i first got the email saying that this is happening i i felt hurt right. and i was confused because i still didn't understand the mistake and the first thing i did i said i need a little victory i went and I ran around Central Park, and that's a six mile run. And I wasn't in the shape to run as hard as I did, but I wanted to have something that I could affect. Right. And your conditioning is what you always can. Mm. You can determine when it starts to hurt if you want to keep going or not. That was no one else's choice but mine. I couldn't, have, couldn't make a choice for them if they were gonna decide to believe me or not. And at that point, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I sure knew that if I go for a run and it gets hard, I can decide if I want to keep going harder or not. And I found a little victory. And there's those little victories that are so important to find. And your fitness is always what you can, what you put in your body eating or, or doing something you, you, when you're alone, start to do some squats, something to compete with. And that's the big thing. When it gets hard, find little victories and being deployed helped me learn that as well, to find something that I can affect. Mm. Well, so, thanks for sharing that, brother. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. No, thank, no, you. That, thank you. Boy. Can we just acknowledge real quick, yes. Yes. West Point grad, yes. working on a second master's, Harvard yes. University. Yes. <laughs> and I heard yeah, a great hugger. Is, you know, he yeah. casually dropped it. I wasn't going to say nothing. Right. And I heard a great <laughs> hugger. Yeah, great <laughs> hugger. You know, casually <laughs> mentioned, you know, I'm working on uh, another grad degree from Harvard. Yo, right. celebrating you, brother. Yeah, but, and, and, look, and look what happened. I remember, and remember still, school, yeah. And now I got brought up on plagiarism. So. <laughs> and, and still, and still, doesn't matter who you are, where you are, we have to find, like you said, ways to, to come up with small victories. Right. Small and victories right. add up 
It's a big ones. Man, and a bunch of them. You. And you know, it's it's interesting. I, I ran for United States Congress. I'm the student whose story is I ran for United States Congress and now got brought up on plagiarism. <laughs> 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 Wait, how, how apolitical do we want to keep this conversation? Going? I know, right? Brother, there are plenty of people who are currently serving in Congress who have yes. far worse infractions than that. Yes. Far worse. Yes. You just had a, a governor resign. Oh, boy, yeah. well, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just letting you know you had a governor. We're just saying, no. just leave it, just leave it alone. As we move on, when you talk about mindset, um, and breathing. I think the next step is gratitude. Mm. Talk about that. Link those two together. Mm. You can tell. I'll tell you what. I, I well, I, I'll I'll approach it from the scientifically proven approach to it. Gratitude and the practice of it. So putting yourself in a position where you can establish again a practice. That's why yoga is a practice. It's called a meditative practice, a restorative practice. None of this is set in stone, never will be perfect. The Dalai Lama himself speaks to still being a student. So if you can put yourself in a position to practice any kind of gratitude, and sometimes it's as simple as, you know what? I'm thankful that I got some food in my belly today. The bare essentials include a roof over your head, clothes on your back, water to put in your body, food to put in your body. Everything else is excess. If you really honestly think about the bare necessities. But the sheer act of creating a practice of gratitude will release the same positive neurochemicals mm -hmm. that exercise induces. So the same serotonin, the same dopamine, the same oxytocin that is released when you feel that it runners high after a good yoga class, a great workout, you can get if you find yourself taking just a few moments. So I try to establish, regardless of what the situation is or where I'm currently feeling emotionally, I at least say, hey, you know what? I'm at least able to feel this, or I'm gonna practice gratitude today because I'm in a position to say thank you for this interview or for the opportunity to share. So allowing yourself just an opportunity to say thanks will help to improve health, increase focus, improve clarity. You know, it's gratitude saved me. When mm. I felt I felt in Houston at the Something Brown Convention Center. George R. Brown Convention Center, yep, yeah, downtown. Uh, at the Olympic trials for the 08 Olympic bo boxing, U.S. Boxing Olympic trials. We were there in 07 for the 08 games. And Kristen flew out. That's my ex-girlfriend who's, who's mm. quadriplegic. And I remember when I lost, and that, uh, it's my second loss, it was double elimination, and that ended the Olympic dream. I remember they rose his hand and I dropped my head. I looked at the ground and I didn't realize I took, I looked at the ground. I took a breath and I said, you know what? I can walk. Mm. It's all right. Mm. And I meant it because I, by living with someone who's paralyzed for so long, living, being with her for so long, I understand what that gift really means. Mm. And I remember I walked out to her and she was crying and I bent down, I put my arms around her, and I said, I'm okay, baby. I promise. I can walk. Right. I'm okay. Wow. And she stopped crying because, I mean, she saved me in that moment by giving me that lesson, that value of just being able to walk, right. that it didn't hurt anymore, that I missed out on making the Olympic team because I can walk. That's, that's and I know that finding means. a moment of gratitude in in a place where you technically lost something, but you didn't. Right. No, you did. You definitely did. Um, also, talk about the power of just the wording, because I think words play a big wor thing when you talk about gratitude. Like um, saying "I get to be" mm. is different than "I gotta do." Mm. Like, talk about that. Because me, gratitude is like, I get to do this podcast. I get to talk to amazing brothers like yourself, you know? Or, you know, I get to, I get to brush my teeth when I wake up every morning. Or I take a shit and I get to wipe my ass because I, I got my hands. <laughs> no, it, hey, simple truths. I'm, they're, I'm, they're, I'm, I'm just saying. But there's yeah, a power I'm, in mantras and affirmations, and that's the reason why 
you know, with, with every thought that you think, it becomes vibrational in your nature. So that what you think becomes your world. And I know I've had plenty of days where I've woken up and have not felt the greatest. And I still walk to the mirror, tears fill in my eyes, and, and I say to myself, I'm proud of you. Wow. Today sucks, but I'm, I'm proud of you. I love you. I forgive you. Thank you. So imagine being able to say that <laughs> even if you don't really feel it. So I, I agree with you, Ishmael. I think there's a power in saying something. I love that you shared, I get to, I don't have to. Right. Like, you know, you don't have to do this, but I get to do this. That's, that's I, I'm gonna steal that. I love that mentality. You know, I rem you ever see the movie, The Rookie with Dennis Quaid? Yes, I remember. Yeah, I love that movie. Like and there was movie. this scene, you know, he was the pressure of his family with his finances and him not getting called right. up and all that. And then, I don't remember what shifted it in his brain. I don't remember the scene that shifted it, but then when he showed up in the dugout the next day, he walks up, not the dugout, the locker room, he walks up to one of the teammates. He goes, you know what we get to do today? We get to play baseball. Yeah. And like, <laughs> as a kid, they're like, that's not what, look, how bad can life be? I get to play baseball today. Yeah. Like, that's a kid's dream as an adult. And he, he got to live that. And, you know, the gratitude, too, of, I used to, when I was with Kristen, I I would lay in bed in the morning when I'd have to use first use the bathroom right. and just not go wow. and let it let it feel how bad it hurt mm. to sit in bed and have to go but not let it build up until I finally would go walk to the bathroom so that I could experience what it would be like to have to hope somebody comes in to help me use the bathroom when I have to go because I mm. can't go on my own. Wow. wow. I used to do that a lot to wow. try to con to uh, be her. Wow. The, the best without being her, to experience mm. her. And it made me very grateful. And one of the things I would always do, like no matter what types of arguments we would get into, Whenever she needed help with something that a, any full-bodied human is should be permitted to do or allowed to do, just by you know, get put your pants on or move here or go get a drink or juice. No matter how angry we may have been, because couples get in a relation, I would never let it cross over into doing those things for her, and it would almost diffuse me immediately to mm. bring my humanity back. No matter what we were arguing about, no matter at all, because I would see sometimes some friends of hers that would move slower to almost right. punish her right. if they were mad at her about something. And I, I was like, that's not fair to do because you're taking their autonomy. That's you're taking advantage right now. That's cruel because that shouldn't cross over. But what do, you you don't punish someone because they're that's their injury that's preventing them from being mm -hmm. able to do just basic stuff, mm -hmm. scratch themselves in a certain spot that they mm -hmm. can't reach. But it would always, I loved it because it would diffuse me and bring my compat my best part of me out, right. and remember how much I love her. Wow. In that moment, despite wow. all the things that I've done throughout life that brought her pain. Wow. Brother, man. Thank you, man. I love you for sharing that, man. You know, I love you every I love you. I tell you, I love you all the time, man. And this has been a great conversation, man. We we have to do this again. But love before we, but if we end before we end this uh great conversation, you guys both do great work with helping um fallen brothers and soldiers when it comes to mental health. Talk about the success of what the government doing or the lack of success they're doing to help the fallen when it comes to mental health? Actually, I'll, ju I'll jump right in. Uh, I'm currently an ambassador and a master teacher for an organization called the Veterans Yoga Project. So if you go to www.veteransyogaproject.org, O-R-G, we are celebrating our 10 year anniversary this year. So we're only recently, like the last six years, um, the, the VA in Los Angeles was the first Veterans Administration organization 
And the VA is basically the caretaking healthcare facilities for veterans, active duty reservists, retired uh, families, dependents. Um, they finally put a yoga therapist on staff. Wow. So part of what we do is help raise awareness that there are benefits to a regular yoga practice, meditation practice for not just those that are currently active duty, but those that are at, uh, reservists, retired, their families, dependents. And so I think that the current government is starting to recognize that we don't always have to go to a place where we push pills. For me, that's a whole other topic. That's a whole other three hour soapbox <laughs> of a conversation <laughs> to have because our Western medicine is dictated by pharmaceutical companies and the monopolies they run. Mm -hmm. And that's why health insurance companies, ABC, XYZ, again, right, right. If you want any more information on that, hit me up. I'll be happy to share that and enlighten you. But I, I believe that the US government specifically is doing more now to recognize mental health struggles and providing resources. And one of those resources I know is the organization that I'm a proud ambassador for, Veterans Yoga Project, and would love to hear uh, anyone else listening, if there are any other organizations, so feel yeah. free to share them, let us know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Boy, I know by still having a foot in the door, by being in the reserve, uh, at least in the reserve sites, I'm imagining it's active duty too, the military is making a conscious effort to integrate into their quarterly training the I the change in mindset that it's okay to ask for help mm -hmm. and get and have relationships, especially in the reserve, it's hard. You see them one week in a month. Make a point of having relationships outside of the one week in a month with your soldiers. And that way you can start learning their patterns so that if you see they deviate from the pattern, you know to ask. Because if it's one week in a month, it's really hard to know what to learn a pattern. And they're putting that in frequently. So you could say that's also the government because the SEC defense, I guess, puts that out, that initiative from that high up and it goes out. The government outside secretary of the military is still not doing a good enough job. It's not a con it's never a conversation and it's now it's a push-up contest of 22 for the veterans mm. and mm. But the plan of action and that's what we're trying to do with our mental health campaign there it's the that i spoke to you about it's the plan of action that may not be there what's beautiful about our country one of the things that's beautiful is the entrepreneurial spirit through nonprofit work mm. where we us citizens can make change yeah. by coming together behind causes such as what brother caesar's doing and you brother is uniting us all together for it so that's what keeps my faith going that there are enough knuckleheads like us yeah. that don't sit around and wait for yeah. big government to do but they should do yeah. because when you're dead it doesn't matter who you want to vote for it doesn't matter what dreams you have for your jobs. It doesn't matter what dreams you've had for your children. It doesn't matter what you think about immigration. It doesn't matter what you think about uh, redistricting and gerrymandering. It doesn't matter about any of that. You're dead. Yeah. It's all gone. Yeah. And what's left behind are us to hurt over those that are gone. Yeah. But in our country, it's a lot of what can you do for me now? The immediacy, not the investment in the human. And uh, is it, we never have the longitudinal approach about if we invest now, even though there's no short-term gain, it's going to pay off. Yeah. Everything's, get it, get Point. it. Yeah. But there's enough Americans that are getting it. Yeah. I think that we're forming these things and it, and it helps. And it's that's a punch at a time to take it. Um, Brother Caesar, my sister just let me know yesterday, two days ago, that her dream, she wants to try to open up some type of veteran retreat in Colleen, oh, Colleen out of all places. Colleen, well, Texas. You know, the huge army base out there. Yeah, I know, that's where her last station was, but it's like, it's a, there's so many in tech where veterans can come in and she has, she said all veterans, ever, all they ever do when they get together is complain. <laughs> And, and, <laughs> and it doesn't matter what era of vets we're talking yeah. about. We, <laughs> about this system, yeah. complain about the VA, yeah. but it's never like productive type of events to do and with yoga being one of them or painting or trips or stuff, um, fitness. And she brought it up to me 
and now ish i i, I um you just helped by connecting me uh, brother cedar i'd love to talk to you more about Absolutely. this and connect with my sister the three of us and again she's a lawyer and she's brilliant and she's determined and she's two-time saudi a year and iraq a year yeah. and she was in iraq in 05 uh when it when it was really bad so um yeah and i want i'll be very happy to share this with her because she's not as outgoing as i am so she doesn't she i think she's afraid to ask at times sure and i say well, you know what happens when you don't ask nothing yeah. happens <laughs> right. so excited right. to stay connected on our way yeah. out i would love yeah. everyone to just be mindful that even if you didn't serve in the military yourself i guarantee you you know somebody who has or you know someone who has who has we're all interconnected so a thousand thank yous ishmael to you, you. boy to you your brother my fried brother to your sister for everyone for serving for your pops and your moms boys parents also serve so like yeah. it comes from a, a, a strong lineage of yeah. strong military folks um i can be reached at the ig handle scroll on the screen below as well as my website and uh, i'd love to stay connected with anyone who has any further questions about meditation mindfulness yoga yo you just want to shoot the shit. you feel like celebrating you feel like asking questions sharing concerns complaints celebrations whatever i just i love being able to talk about this yeah. and cannot wait to see you both again and we will we definitely boy, will when i get back to new york absolutely september, seeing you september soon. right brother yes, sir. we're gonna make it happen but we're out of okay bro boy you had well, something to say, easy, you're, you're all right with ish sending a three-way text offline so we have absolutely to, yes we'll, please we'll make it happen we'll share make it happen. all of my info yes. yeah we, we we're yeah. gonna take care of it we're out of here Boyd, do you have to say something? Do you want to say something to the people before we leave? How do people get in touch with you, Boyd? Uh, well, Ish is my pimp, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why you're outside now, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, not, uh, I was about to get my phone over. So uh, my, I, my IG handle is... Um, Boyd Melson, Amazon Mary, at Boyd Melson, Amazon Mary for Melson. It's the same on Instagram. And uh, if anybody needs help, send me an email. Uh, the best I can help you. Uh, BAM strong, like strong muscles, 1981 at gmail.com. I will respond to you. I gave my email out when I was on the Breakfast Club and I got about 30 emails <laughs> and I responded to everybody. Yeah. I will respond to you. Please email me if I'll try to help you the best I can. But don't take advantage, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the pimp is going to come after you. Let me stop. Let me get it. I'm out. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> we out. Thank you, brothers, both. Thank you both so Same much. Same here. <laughs> All right. I'm so happy. Thank you, Ish. Thank you, brother.